Bruce. Hello, folks. Um, we're running five minutes late. Our um, intended guest is having um, major technical difficulties. She's been in trying for the last half hour. It's just not working for her. Um, so we're going to go impromptu. We've both, um, Adriana and I, have been running the show now for quite some time, and we've actually done a lot of travelling, and I noticed that when we had our guest on, there was a lot of places that we had actually gone to. So we had a lot of things in common to actually speak about. And um, so it's a shame, really. So, um, yeah. Okay, so um, obviously the beauties of radio stations and doing live shows rather than pre-recorded, it's always been our, our philosophy to go live because the story is a lot more easy to come by and, and it's more refreshing, actually. So... Uh, obviously, my co-host is in the UK, Andrina, and um, it's a, obviously a good evening here in Australia, and it's a good morning to you. Hi, good morning, and uh, welcome to anyone and everyone that's listening to Dream in the New Dream. Um, as Jeff said, <coughs> excuse me, unfortunately, our guests had mega problems um, trying to get online down in Cornwall, so... Um, yeah, so it's just Jeff and I, we're going to do a chit chat. Um, um, so first of all, I'd like to say that I'm really thankful that I've been given the opportunity to do Dream in the New Dream. And I've looking back on the flyers as I do a flyer for each person, I've been amazed at how many people over the weeks, I'm not sure what date I started, but looking back, um, I've had the opportunity to talk with and interview some amazing people with amazing stories to share, amazing wisdom, out there walking their talk and dreaming the new dream. So I just want to say thank you for giving me that opportunity because um, I've really enjoyed it. And this is the first technical hitch we've had. So I don't think we've done too bad as far as I'm concerned in all the shows. It, this is the um, first one. So, yeah. There you go. That's how we started the show. Um, I think it was back in um, August last year. So um, let's, let's see what we've got. So um, first of all, the original lady was Julia Choi, and she um, came from, mother was German, and her dad was Malaysian Chinese, and she was the one that was instrumental, and so Jeff, can we do a show? And of course, um, as a result, we um, came aboard with the concept of dreaming the new dream because we were looking at life and realising that as I said to Julia, excuse me, in Germany, did you have Monopoly? Oh, yeah, we had Monopoly. I said, oh, right, okay. Now, you know, um, in the game of Monopoly, obviously, um, you throw the dice and whoever's got the biggest numbers gets the bank. And, of course, the money's already printed. So if the money's already printed, the next question is you step up to the game and, of course, your, your job is to accumulate. And, uh, <laughs> you know, who wants to end up on Old Kent Road? Um <laughs> But then, anyway, you so say, well, so you go around and you might end up on the community card and you might get the get out of jail card or you then start acquiring property, get the street, get the houses, get the hotels, you know, the game, get a superannuation through um, utilities or the railway stations. But then you might go broke. And um, shortly afterwards, you leave the game, you go outside and you might kick a ball around or, you, you know, whatever it takes your fancy. And then before you know it, there's a few others have left the game. So Dreaming the New Dream is about the fact, okay, we've been on this cycle called accumulation and um, capitalism, and we're playing this game. You go to school, get a good education, get a good job, um, find a partner, get a house, have kids, have to see the kids get married, boom, boom, see you later, pop the clogs. Not much of a life, is it? So Dreaming the New Dream is about looking for passion, you know, and of course passion is something that's, We've all been gone this God-given right, a passion, you know, like, what is it? Is it ornithology, going out there to study birds and then joining with photography and taking photos of birds? You know, is it going out there and catching a wave and surfing away and all of a sudden dolphins turn up? You know, or look, it might be Skittles over there in the UK at your local pub. I mean, passion is about whatever brings delight to your soul and, and makes your heart sing. It's very important. So, and then some people might just prefer to look at history. I mean, I, I wasn't one for history. I never liked history, but <laughs> yeah. entering, um, as you get older and then you decide, oh, I wouldn't mind checking out the Acropolis or I might want to see the 
the pyramids or you know you want to go and see the grand grand canyon i mean th these are all things that have been thrown in our face when we grew up looking at life magazine and then later on tv came along and they showed you these events and places and say you feel like traveling and meet those places but to be able to walk in someone's shoes that takes a lot you know so on this on this planet you have people who've come in a different faith and and, and they've been educated to that particular faith, and whether it's Catholicism or Hindu or Sufis, uh, the question at the end of the day is, at the end of the day, we're all human, and we're all in the classroom. It just happens that our planet is a school, and um, we all march into a different beat. And, and until such time as we walk in that person's mo moccasins, then we start to become more aware of who we really are. And, and it's like the, the coin. I mean, there's three sides to the coin, isn't there? There's heads and tails. So... I'm down here in the southern, hemis southern hemisphere. You're in the northern hemisphere. So you're seeing heads, I'm seeing tails. But <laughs> until I turn that coin around and I get to see your side and you get to see my side, then we t flip the coin on its side and then we see that leading edge and there's the truth. So it's it's very important for us to bring that out. So hence the show, Dreaming the New Dream. And, of course, Andrew and I have both have an affinity with dolphins and whales. So the original logo we had was a dream catcher and so catching dreams and dreaming a new dream but for most people who are out there you know dolphins whales it could be birds it could be dogs and cats we just chose to go with these colors um because it felt to us that water was such an emotional connection and, and emotions is really heartfelt you know and until such time as you know you meet this lady we had on the show some time ago janet and she had the horses. Oh, okay. sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Janet. Wales. And so, you know, she actually mentioned, you know, when she's talking to people who come and see the horses, uh, <clears throat> they all come from the headspace. Oh. And then she said, well, how does it feel? And when you go into that feeling, it seems like your heart opens up and uh, you, you become a, a new human. So, Andrina, that's what we've got the show for. It's to bring people who've got different passions and show people that, you know, you don't have to play Monopoly. There's other ways of looking at life. And so yeah. for those people who've so chosen to step out of life and go off the grid or, you know, become traveling Wilburys, you know, I salute you. It's fantastic. So, um, I mean, we're, we're told to go and sign the tax form number, so even capital letters. <laughs> so we pay a tax and then of course we're expected to live to 60 65 so to speak and then we retire and what are we retiring on it's just the, mm. and then before you know it so many people pop the clogs because they haven't got a passion they haven't got a dream because of being providers we've had to get up and go to work and come back and sometimes you guys in the uk you're going to work in the dark and come home in the dark <laughs> so, but um yeah. is that life is that what life's all about so you can understand now why our show dreaming the new dreams is about getting people from all around the world and um obviously you might have a passion but when it comes to um technology and we are learning the balance of you know what comes inside ourselves and we're using the technology that's been manifested in the western world and, and using it to be able to do what we're doing tonight which is you're in the uk and i'm in australia and we're broadcasting we're going live on radio but we're also going live on facebook and youtube so I mean, you've got to bring that balance, and sometimes people don't have that understanding of technology yet, as we've found out tonight. You know? So, or today, your time. So, mm. what do you do? So, um, hence, um, we do what we're doing now. We go on the fly, we, you know, we share. So, yeah. um, I'm kind well, of we, we, we didn't have a backup plan, did we, as such? But we thought maybe, a, you know, a just a general chit chat because, um, like we both got the same passions, making a difference, helping people and giving people opportunities, whether it's just sitting in a cafe chatting or being in the board on the broadcast. So um, so if anybody knows of anybody else, I've got quite a few speakers lined up and a couple of people have approached me that they'd like to come on the show. Um, so it's always nice to have um individuality so if anybody knows of anybody that's doing something and they're it's really their passion and they'd like to share we'd be more than happy so 
just get in touch on Facebook um, or Messenger, send a, send a request and we see what we can do to put you on the show. But if anybody wants to go back um, and look at any of the shows, you can go on Dream in the New Dream page and when you scan down, it's got all the videos. Um, gosh, there's so many videos on there. But, um, and I can't say I've got a favourite out of all of them because they all come with different um, capabilities. And some people I think, oh, wow, that's amazing. And then somebody else think, oh, wow, you know, it's just, I, I sit here going, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, so, oh, Julia, now I've done... I've done beautiful workshops with Julia when I was in, um, where was I on the Byron Gold Coast? I forgot where I've been here, there and everywhere, but yeah. Um, so it, we're open um, to having people come on and share their passion and share their gifts um, and Val. And yeah, no, I, I did ask Francis. Was there a uh, Andrea, Andrea's found a technology. She's here. Oh, she? Yeah. Just hang on. I'll bring her on. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. I don't know where I've been. <laughs> I've been everywhere trying to get in, and then my computer finally let me in. So. Oh, well, that's good. You've made. Welcome to Dreaming the New Dream. And we have the lovely <laughs> Andrew <Andrew's> folks. <laughs> yeah. I think that that it's like very strange here. <laughs> I'm in Cornwall. So hold on, now it's it's flashing up some other things. So we're here anyway. <laughs> oh well that, that's a start. So um we're just getting in a flow of a chit chat and, and offering people the chance that if they're creating their passion and they want to come on the show to get in touch. So anyway, here you are. Yeah, maybe we can do overcoming adversity and, and blockages and things because I do think sometimes things try and stop you, and it's oh. you know you've got to go through that. And it's and I think like everybody, it's like trying to go through obstacles put in our way. And sometimes you know, like I was listening before to the lovely Michael Lamb that you were interviewing, and it is it's the realms of the unseen and the other dimensions sometimes trying to stop things and you know we've got to push through all that and because I mean like I'm sure you can feel energies I can feel energy sometimes trying to stop stuff mm -hmm. and you've got to push through all that especially I think when we want to deal with this kind of work there's often blockages put in the way and and going through that and just still persevering because I think it's so easy to give up for people isn't it yeah definitely I know that um Carol and I were um, in Bradford on Avon and we'd gone to a pub. I think it was about a six, 16th, 17th century pub. I can't remember now. It was all set up. I'd gone the day before. I tried everything out. That day, we could not get on. We couldn't use our phones. We were so blocked and we knew it and felt it. it was So, yeah. Anyway, you're here now. So. <laughs> Why, why, why it is because it is those energies that we're, we're dealing with so do you want me to explain what I do yeah so yeah so because you're just I mean I've known you over the years and we've often bumped into each other in Glastonbury and what have you and friends for supper so because you're just on the outskirts of Glastonbury aren't you because I know you can see the tour from the bottom of your garden yeah I can see the tour from my garden in Glastonbury and I'm not in Glastonbury at the moment I'm in Cornwall so um I'm at my little chalet called Sea Angel in Cornwall, which is actually a, a good story in itself for people. Um, but first of all, I'll explain that I do past life regression, inner child healing, ancestral timeline healing, spirit releasement, and I speak light language. And I've done that for 22 years since I had my awakening when I lived in London. And when I was in London, I was meditating back in 2007, having never been to Cornwall, had no idea where it was. I've heard people talk about it. And in my vision came this little white chalet with baby blue painted windows. And the message I got was, if you Google it, you'll find it. So it took me three days and it was for sale. So I bought it just off my meditation and I think that the energies here and when Michael Lamb was talking about 
stargate portals on the planet and all those things this ties in because i believe that this is one of the cities of light in cornwall where my chalet is and over across the bay was where they had the g7 summit last year oh, yeah. so all kinds of energies are here so when we follow our intuition on buying a property, we can't be wrong, even though our ego mind can go, that makes no sense, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. But on a higher level, everything always makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to know about your awakening. So where were you born? Let's start, at, let's start at the beginning. <laughs> I was born in, well, I was born in Stoke-on-Trent up north, but I was brought up living in Cheshire. Um, and then I went to school there. I was a model for probably nearly 13, 14 years. I did that full time all, you know, abroad and in the UK. And then I came to London working. And then it was around about 2000, 2001, when I had my awakening. I wasn't into any of this. You know, if somebody mentioned astrology, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I was interested in astrology, but mm. really on a basic level, I didn't know anything else. And then a lady went to my gym. She was saying she was going to the College of Psychic Studies in London. And I said, oh, that sounds fun to do an astrology course. And she kept almost pestering me every week saying, have you gone? I'm like, no, no. And almost a year went by when I finally went to the College of Psychic Studies and I was going to sign up for an astrology course and they said they're fully booked. So I actually signed up to go on whatever I had available for that weekend, which was a psychometry course, which um, I'm sure a lot of your listeners know is like holding jewelry on an inanimate project and picking up information about people from those. So they were great. They knew all about me. I didn't know these people in the room. We all passed our jewelry around and I picked up information about them. And they said it was accurate. Their, their information was accurate about me. And then from that, I signed up to a development course. Um, but the teacher wasn't um, as lovely as the teacher from that day workshop. But then a friend of mine who was a model said to bring for a psychic reading somewhere. So I signed up to going for the psychic reading with the same man. And he said, this is going to be this is going to be your path. This is what you're going to be doing. And I was like, I don't think so. And um, very quickly, it did become my life. And, you know, all this stuff, just from going to a development course, not the one at the College of Psychic Studies, this mystical man that I went to see uh, for the reading had a development course that he arranged every week. And I sat with these people. And from being, you know, really not, particularly good at school, daydreaming out the window, not paying attention. Um, all of a sudden, I was attentive, interested, and almost like top of the class at the School of Hogwarts. And that was that was kind of what happened. And it was, you know, we were doing development stuff, and it was, you know, other people would say things like, oh, I think you were lovely in your childhood, or I see the colour orange. But I was really tuning in, getting really specific information, like, you know, you lived with your granddad, you lived on this address in your childhood. It was really accurate. And I wasn't trying. That was the thing, you know, like school, you've got to try. This was not trying. This was just, like, naturally coming to me. Yeah. And so, yeah, I developed really quickly. I used to work on QVC in the UK, which was good because... I would go and get press discount for things and I'd have crystals in my pocket and show people things. And at the time, there was a holistic health company that had a flagship store in London called Aveda. And that was privately owned then by Hearst Becker, And they invited me to give talks in their stores. So I was giving lots of talks in their stores. And then they said, do you want to put flyers to, you know, for clients and it didn't dawn on me to do that but they were so kind and helpful and then I started to see people's past lives just naturally seeing people's past lives but I couldn't work out what the benefit to that would be me just saying blah 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 because I wasn't that evolved back then and uh, so I went then I very quickly did end up on tv talking about being psychic um, because I ended up being mugged and strangled. So I ended up talking about being psychic. Then a year later, I was back on this Kilroy show talking about being psychic. 
so the whole thing was sort of like tying in together to an awakening and then I learned past life regression from a guy who taught me hypnotherapy past life regression and inner child healing and then all these amazing things were happening I was levitating off my bed I was being almost doing like what we would now call hand light language but I didn't know what it was then it was just like my hand wafting so I was doing these hand waftings over myself and everything they were telling me all these colors all these energies were coming in I was doing channelings everything that they were telling me would literally come true the next day so everything was lining up and it was like I was in my own little Celestine prophecy and they told me not to work for three months and I, and I trusted it and I was living in a really expensive place so I was like how am I going to pay the rent if I'm not going to work for three months but they were like trust everything will be provided for and then they my energy blew the electrics in the house and then when the owner of the flat had to come and the electricity board came to check this electric they said this is substandard you shouldn't even be renting the flat to someone with this kind of electric so i got i got rent free for three months which was a three month told me not to work you know so so everything was just lining up to facilitate me and then what they were saying if people understand what a soapbox is it was it's like an old-fashioned metaphor for speaking the truth on top of a platform so I was being given this message you need to stand on a soapbox for what you believe in and speak the truth as you know it to be and and every night they were doing these healing work and I would write these channelings and you know, they were beyond my level of comprehension. Me as Andrea didn't understand these channelings. And at the time they were giving me like mathematical equations for the elixir of life, um, telling me how the cosmos and the universe worked. But um, as me, I didn't have the intelligence to understand the information that I was being given. I didn't know who mm. these people were telling me this. But I was starting to feel like everything was love. And for months I just lived in this high state of everything being love. And I was starting to lose physical density, like my body was losing physical density, I didn't have any physicality or just almost just like light beaming. And then after I ended up on this TV show, lots of people who saw me were trying to connect with that energy. Some not so benevolent people um, mm -hmm. managed to avoid them, which was a whole story in itself. Um, but the other stuff that I was being given was at the very end days of working on QVC, I almost sit there just beaming this light. And there's people who've seen me since that time said I knew you were doing something that you looked like you were doing something else but I knew you were just shining this this energy at the time and that energy lasted at that high level for quite a long time and then it changed and obviously more life experiences came in and you know challenges come to you and it what it didn't stay at that high level but it's gone back and two to that level sometimes and then they were saying you know in this big soapbox that you're going to stand on you've got to speak your truth and I was being told you, you know we're going to do something big so just trust to that and I was just totally trusting and and after learning how to do regression I had all these private clients and then very quickly one day a friend just said to me do you want to go on this morning and regress the host of the show you know which this morning is like good morning America and in America it's like our main morning tv show in the uk and i said yes and we filmed philip schofield and fern being regressed and then we aired it the beginning of um january 2004 and then i went on the set we aired this thing and they just said can you come back every week till we make your own show no yeah, fantastic <laughs> <laughs> really. And then I did two series of my own show called The Vibe in Here before. But I liked This Morning better because with This Morning I could regress members of the public and, which I like doing members of the public and celebrities, but with the members of the public I was allowed to focus more on the healing aspects of past life regression although they wouldn't let me show inner child healing. But they did twice let me talk about spirit releasement. Oh, which really? was for terrestrial tv to touch on 
spirit releasement. And then I would be getting like a thousand people a day emailing, asking about, you know, oh my God, thank God you've talked about this. You know, it was making the spiritual world by putting it on terrestrial TV. It wasn't in a closet. It was, you know, mainstream every week for quite a long period of time and allowed people in the UK, you know, to start talking about their own spiritual experiences and validating, you know, that they may be having experiences of seeing past lives naturally. Mm. <laughs> so that was 2004 to 2007 I did these shows. And then in 2013, I was on a BBC show called The Big Question. And I'd oh, yeah. already been a year earlier. And um, a year earlier, it was like living the witch trials of Salem. I, as it happened, I could experience what was happening. So I went back on a year later when they invited me to just check that I cleared this, you know, witch trials of Salem thing. And what actually happened then was I just out of my mouth came out about the Illuminati, <clears throat> came about, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> even talking about it, it's losing my voice. Yeah. <laughs> I talked about the Illuminati, I talked about um, the food and drug industry because the, the subject was about should we should we have a tax on sugar? So I just went off into this blah, 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 blah. And then I started going on about it being a holographic universe. And these people all just looked at me horrified, like, you know, what is she saying? Why is she, why is she saying these things? And I just felt so liberated, like, oh, I've done what I came to do. And, and I felt good. And I still felt good afterwards, even though I never worked on TV after that. I never, really? worked, I never worked on TV. I was never interviewed on a radio show. And I was never invited to mainstream press anymore as in print press that was it <laughs> really <laughs> no surprise <laughs> so it shows you how in the background these things are going on oh it's interesting thrown up a picture of trump i've got a really lovely story about trump that i've never told anybody <laughs> oh please share <laughs> you, will, you will love this story so just before he got elected, I was having these dreams with Trumpykins, okay? <laughs> so so they, they were quite benevolent dreams. They were quite positive, although I did see him almost dressed in Freemasonry outfit. But then one time he was being hit and his nose was bleeding. So I had all these, these dreams about him. And then I was one day looking on a website called Secret Flying, and I used to spend a lot of time going back into to Sedona and to Hawaii, to the Big Island. And so <clears throat> this flight was to Maui, and I thought, I've never been to Maui, I'll go to Maui. But it was a really weird one, because I had to go via uh, Inverness in Scotland. It was a strange flight from Inverness, which allowed me to go to Fintorn, if anyone knows what Fintorn is. And I'd always wanted to go to Fintorn. And I was like, now I'm going to Fintorn via Inverness and also via Maui. So I get, I get this flight to Maui. I stay at this retreat center. On the last day of being there, I'm talking with the interns about my dreams with Trumpy Kins. And they were validating, saying they'd had similar dreams about Trumpykins and this other woman arrived with her husband and um she was looking at me and she seemed really twinkly herself and she came over and she's like can I have a chat with you about what you're talking about so we have this chat I go up to the yoga studio her husband sat there tapping away on a computer and um I speak light language and she says maybe I speak light language so she speaks light language as well although she's never spoken light language before and then I told her about my dreams and she said maybe you can share your dreams and what you experienced with my husband who's the Prime Minister of Romania so, <laughs> this was the Prime Minister of Romania and his wife so and recently in the last few months the only reason i'm sharing this story because in the last few months everyone who speaks in exopolitics have been talking about the stargate portals in romania so i thought how bizarre that i've had this connection at this really high vibrational portal in maui because there's like a pyramid in the sea in maui where where the where i was with these people and we were all singing like <laughs> So I think that's just a wonderful 
the story to show you that if you trust where you're meant to be, you know, you're going there with the most innocent of intentions and with good intentions for yourself and humanity. But if you're meant to cross paths, and I've got all kinds of stories like that over the years, that if you're meant to cross paths with these people, you will. You know, and all I can say, they're not they're not the president anymore. Um, but at the time when I had that experience, they they had been. Um, because I don't think in Romania they last as long as they do in the UK to be mm. a you know, I don't think your length of um whatever it is, what's it called, presidency lasts that long over there. But what it showed me was there were really beautiful people who were really, you know, very um, spiritually aligned with beautiful intention for humanity um, in those positions. Yeah. And not everybody is bad that high up in, in, you know, the world. They're not all bad. There are good people seeping through behind the scenes exactly. to facilitate good things for humanity. Mm -hmm. Well, I will ask you at some point, will you do some light language? I just love light yeah. language. It's just the only thing is, there is a bit of feedback on this. I don't know if Jeff can tell. Can you tell us some feedback? Because if I do a really loud light language, it will probably go a further feedback. I don't know if it's my sound that I need to turn down or something. Or is I, it can I can turn you down. That's not a problem. Yeah, <laughs> just the or something, because sometimes it will reverb on it. So... <laughs> No, I've, got I, you, uh, I've, got, I've got you sorted. You're all sorted now. I've got you sorted. Okay. Shall I explain what light language yeah, is? Yeah, me? no, go for it. From my perception of what I believe light language is, and everybody believes it's something different, I spoke little languages as a child to myself, but I didn't really question what those were, and I certainly didn't know any other children who spoke little languages to themselves. Um, but I just did them. It wasn't what it became now in how I speak langu languages. There are people who speak languages, which is, I believe, the tongues of our souls. So they're back to Lumeria and they're back to ancient star systems. Um, there are lots of different languages, so if you don't resonate with mine or you don't resonate with some others, there's a reason. Maybe it's not for your soul. That language is not resonating for your soul. It's a different language. Um, so be very discerning. You don't have to accept all of them just because you think someone speaks light language. Um, in fact, I had a funny story the other day. I was at the Chalice Well in Glastonbury, and um, I was uh, lighting a candle for some I'd had a lot of people pass over in, in February this year, six people I knew passed over and it was one of their funerals. And um, I saw someone I vaguely know there and I said to him, oh, could you just film this or take a photo for me uh, lighting a candle at the chalice well for these people who passed over so I can send it to their family to say, because I couldn't go to the funeral, I was lighting this candle um, so that it would, be nice for them and I said then I'm going to sing some light language he went if you're going to sing light language you've got to go and he gave me my phone and he was gone <laughs> and so I thought oh my god that's so funny that you know at least he knew he wasn't open to light language and he went that was well he made saying. it perfectly clear eh <laughs> he freaked him out and that's a beautiful picture of the, of the chalice well in Glastonbury with the Vesica Pisces on the on the um, lid. And, you know, and Andrina and I love going to, to the chalice mm -hmm. well. Um, so, yeah, so talk back to the light language. So you've got all these sophophonic frequencies. So from my perception of my understanding of light languages, it's opening dormant DNA codes that have been shut down in in for a lot of people. It's in your head. Um, or for some people, they feel it in their heart or they just feel emotions come up or they feel like their body's vibrating. But we have had our DNA shut down and sound is everything. And I know you do sound healing as well, and Andrina. And sound healing is opening the codes. It can open, you know, if you have the correct people together at a Stargate portal on the planet and they have the ability to sing or create those octaves, you can open dimensions and portals to other realities. 
And that's why I was so enjoying that conversation that you'd had. I thought it was just before me with Michael um, Lamb, but it was so <laughs> great what he was saying about the Stargate portals and everything. And then if you, if your body is like a living portal in itself, so it can do amazing things for you as a droidal energy field portal. And then when you align to the Stargate portals on the planet or where there's sacred zones or, or sites, at the right time of the solstice or the, the sun hitting the stone and your sound, you open the realities and dimensions up mm. because it isn't, you know, they, they want us to be in 3D, but we're more than 3d you know we're opening up to that those stones are actually man-made stones but they're in say, they do look very real portland bill near weymouth in the uk oh, yeah. which is really interesting because i think they have 15 masonic um lodges in portland back in the day where the phoenicians came so portland was a really powerful point and also a lot like Paul's Cathedral was made from the stones from Portland. So, mm. so it's a, a very powerful point there. Um, and a lot of people there have a certain look about them. You can see the people who are multi-generational who lived in Portland. They've all kind of they're all kind of blonde, blue-eyed, the, the local inhabitants of Portlandville, um, around there. So shall I sing a light language now? Does that yeah, yeah. That'd be lovely. If we just close our eyes and just take a deep breath and just let this sound ripple through your body and I'll just be quiet for a few seconds at the end it'll be about a minute transmission but just bringing in connecting with whoever's going to watch this in the past present future in all timelines of existence for that collective soul energy of people so <sighs> Oh, magic. Uh -huh. You know, it, it goes down through, through me and like tingling and vibrating. And I just, I just love it. It's, you know, it's just amazing. Um, yeah, love it. I was I huge. Had, Sorry. I had to work. I mean, I think people don't realise to be able to speak codes you've got to like when i was younger and i lived in london i got mugged and strangled so they tried to take some octaves out of my throat i think that was why because when they read the timelines they can see who you are what you're going to do you know what your potential is so if they can try and stop you from doing what you're gonna you came here to do yeah. um, so i ended up after being mugged and strangled i ended up on thyroxin for an underactive thyroid and i was on that for 16 years and wow. then about five years ago i decided to take myself off it but like a lot of things when you take yourself off it terror fear comes over you because you think oh my god i never want to go through those experiences again mm -hmm. and so 
you have to go inside yourself, heal, heal all the trauma of that, whether it's past life. You know, a lot of us have had trauma done to our throat from past lives or we've been, you know, I know it's a bit formulate by saying we've been witches or priestesses. But, you know, a lot of women who are doing mystical stuff now have been. And, you know, they've either been strangled, they've been drowned, you know, their voices have been silenced. And this, you know, it, it, it isn't a, a male form of patriarchy. The patriarchy can come through women as well. It's not, it's not the, you know, the divine masculine is a higher vibration that supports, you know, the evolution of humanity. Whereas this old patriarchal, old energy, which is what we're clearing from the planet now, more intensely the last two years, that's what's tried to stop our voices you know, from being heard to shut you down and stop you from speaking your truth. And, you know, most of humanity have had this spell cast upon them to to almost find it so hard to speak the truth. You know, it's that they're, they're silenced into not speaking their truth or fearful that someone's going to attack them. Um, so we're clearing all that mm. that's coming up for humanity to be able to speak from our hearts again not from our wounded you know heart but from the divine uh heart of ourselves mm. definitely definitely and especially with the last couple of years you know mega 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 where everybody's been shut down and and you know blah 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 um yeah so it's a mat it's a amazing a massive amount of clearing is going on still isn't it yeah you know? and I, I think a lot of people will be leaving i think there's been more yeah. people on the, on the planet than perhaps were ever going to be here and they just came for that end of the cycle end of the twenty six thousand year cycle to be here for this transition it's like i said i've never seen so many people leaving you know and they were people who had taken the jibby jab and there were people who, who hadn't taken the jibby jab leaving so it is a mixture and through asking in client sessions you know who who is going to make it now and what they were saying which is these luminescent beings um Clients often go to this place between lives when I take them to this place between lives and they describe these luminescent beings and without them realizing it, they all describe them looking very similar, these beings, mm. the luminescent. And these beings were saying that you, it's not as you think it is. Everybody who's going to stay now is for a much higher reason they're yeah. staying not going to be taken out necessarily because they did the ding ding um some of those people will get very ill in the next few years and some people will miraculously seem to have survived it and not and they said it's on a much higher soul level than we could even put into our human minds of comprehension mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when I had my awakening, and I was talking about that with you earlier, I was working with the Pleiadians. And at the time, all these people came into my life to help me. And I read Barbara Massiniak's book, um, Bringers of the Dawn. And uh, that really helped me. And years later, I, I met Barbara twice <laughs> in oh, Sedona. <laughs> and um, yeah, I had some really amazing experiences with her. And so all this star being lineage within us is awakening it's it's not necessarily like they're going to come it's like we're waking up to who we were before they shut our dna codes down so we may have had you know in my own experience i believe i've had expressions of time in pleiadian energies and then in sirius b energies and then andromedan and mm -hmm. um maybe a tiny, tiny bit of time in Venusian energies. And then when I was listening to those light languages at the end, the clicky sound is more to do with the um, Octurian energy. So it's more, the, the clicky sounds are very Octurian to me. And I know there are people who um, they say they can teach people to speak light language. I don't believe you need to do that. I think you just no. need to 
allow people to clear a lot of what I'm working with now with people is healing their inner child from this lifetime you know the big thing now is healing from the womb to present day healing the trauma reclaiming the fragments of our soul um that has been very traumatic to us um hold on something's coming up on my computer just moving it out the way um <laughs> You know, clearing that inner child, the wound trauma. And often I get clients saying, oh, but I've healed my inner child. I'm like, okay, well, that's great if you've healed it. But we'll see what comes up. And then they're like, I never thought there was all that yet to come up. Because I think people, well, when I was doing the past life regression on TV, I think people were surprised how open people were to doing past life regression, even though they might not necessarily have been quote spiritual people, they could see the past life as almost like uh, not them. It wasn't personal. They, I mean, to me, it's deeply personal. It's you, it's your soul. It's everything you've ever been. But from their perspective, they could almost detach from it. Whereas when you start, talking about inner child the average person isn't going to come to see you to do inner child healing no. they're going to come on the premise that they want to see a past life and then they might get blocked going into their past life and they're usually blocked because uh they either have some inner child stuff to work on or they have an entity attached who's blocking things or sometimes if they're really, really stuck, it's because, but most of those people who are narcissistic wouldn't reach out for therapy. You know, they're not no. gonna, they'd have to get almost tricked and duped into it. And mostly people who can't do regression have really controlling personalities or they have entities attached or they have a really deeply wounded inner child that they're terrified about healing. And also you have to be very gentle with people because even though as an intuitive reading the emotional Akashic records, so I'm very specific in saying I read the emotional Akashic records. So that's identifying the origin of the emotional trauma and taking you back to the origin of the emotional trauma or telling you what I get and then you clearing it in your body. I'm not clearing it for you. You're I'll guide you into clearing it out of your emotional Akashic records so that you can be free of it. But it is a journey for people and people are almost so addicted to their trauma that <laughs> they don't understand. And it's like that, a roll call. <laughs> yeah, they're like, well, I mean, I've lived with it for so long. Surely it can't be that bad. And it's like, yeah, but who could you be without this? Exactly. You know? yeah. And and you know, because my biggest passion is helping people heal by not needing pharmaceutical drugs and not needing operations necessarily. Um, but not everybody sees that as a as a bonus. You know, a lot of people don't see there's any benefit to that. You know, they'd rather have the operation and take the drugs, whereas I would rather heal myself, like I heal myself of my broken ankle. Yeah. Did you want to share about your ankle? Because that was an amazing journey, wasn't it? Yeah, that, again, that was weird. It was, I live, like you said, I live in Glastonbury. I also live near where the festival site is, but not near enough to get tickets to go, but near enough to hear the <laughs> tape. Doof, doof. So it was three minutes before the main stage on the Saturday. Um, I had some new flat frumpy shoes, really flat on. Um, and I just stepped outside off a step like that. And I don't even think I fell. Something went and I just fell to the floor. My ankle twisted all the way round and I broke it. And I somehow got myself from outside, inside. Um, I managed to put my foot, my ankle on a paint pot and twist it back into place because there was no pain. Because when you're in shock, there's no pain. And I'm, I don't remember just sitting there wiggling it about, but I was in shock and I thought, I do need to call an ambulance. I know I've broken it. So I called an ambulance, waited eight hours for this ambulance to come. <laughs> and then I waited another few hours once I got to the hospital. And, um, and then they put this back slab thing on and then you go back a few days later and they were like, no, you you're, you're going to need surgery. I was like, no. And they went, yeah, you're going to need pins and plates 
I was like, I don't think that's going to work for me. I said, <laughs> and they were like, what? <laughs> and, and, and I think the surgeon was embarrassed because he had a whole room full of students with him. And I was just like, with the greatest love and respect and honour for the work you've done. I said, I must honour the work I've done for 20 years. So can you just put a plaster cast on and squash it together and I'll be going. And I was lucky that the guy who did the plaster cast was an Egyptian doctor. And I think he was more old school and I think he knew that I could probably be okay um but this this surgeon guy was just so angry he was like an angry dragon <laughs> like, you know and, and they tried to really push me like they were saying sign these forms I said but why I'm not going to do this surgery and they were like well you might change your mind I went no I won't and <laughs> <laughs> and so I managed to get my mind into the quantum field because they said it was non-union, so it wasn't like it was even lined up. So, but I was I never took any painkillers or anything, and I was in a high state of joy for weeks with this broken ankle until they took the plaster cast off and they put a fiberglass cast on, and then the fires of hell happened, and I just kept getting flashbacks to three past lives. One, which I think was the cause of this in the beginning, I'd been an African woman in a past life with one leg. And when I triggered that memory through someone giving me a deep tissue massage years ago, um, the, the muscles in my buttocks stopped firing. I went to see a chiropractor and he said the muscles have stopped firing in, in, your, in your hip area. So I had to tell my mind that I wasn't an African woman with one leg anymore. You know, I, I, I've got two legs and they both need to walk. Um, but that had obviously triggered a weakness in the left side by the memory coming up, but not completely clearing it. And then while I had this fiberglass cast on, a, a memory came up of being a nurse on a battlefield and, and me having post-traumatic stress and just the, the terror of seeing all these men with you know limbs all blown off and and so i had to clear that and then i had another flashback because when they'd wrapped my ankle they twisted the lining so it was really tight and that triggered a past life memory of my ankle being stuck in a bear trap in another lifetime so i had to clear <laughs> so i cleared all these past lives i did think twice while i was laying there with this broken ankle taking it never dawned on me to take any painkillers and it wasn't it wasn't painful till this other plaster cast came on but um i did surrender into dying twice i did think i would die and the lady that and it brought up all kinds of other emotions like you live on your own you i had to find somebody to come and help me every day because i literally couldn't survive without somebody coming mm -hmm. to help me and then you notice your vulnerability of living on your own. Like if I couldn't have hired somebody to come, I would have died. You know, it was that bad. And so I surrendered into dying twice. And even the lady who looked after me a few months in, she did so. Oh, I, did, I did wonder if you'd be here the next day when I came back. <laughs> you did look like you weren't going to make it. And I said, I really didn't think I was going to be here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then that's the, death and that's the death and rebirth that we go through you know we all go have to go through the, the petty death what they say in french isn't it is called petty death mm -hmm. it, you don't die and i think this is the this is the fear that people have about doing their inner work that they think that they'd rather die than face their inner self you know, and I tell a story that is quite shocking about a client that I had come because in the UK, there's a 1939 cancer act that stops us from talking about healing cancer alternatively. But I had a client come. He said he had cancer in a forearm here. And he said, I get that you can heal yourself. I've seen other people heal themselves. With cancer. I said, great, because, you know, you've got to be in that mindset. Otherwise, I wouldn't work with you because I, I, I've been doing this long enough to know that I can't heal anybody of cancer. They're going to heal themselves. And um, so I start working with him. I realize he's got an issue with male authority figures, even though he's a very successful 
banker in his 40s and he's had this cancer in his forearm removed once before and so as we start to go into the past lives of why why has the cancer manifested here why is it not here here why is it here and it's manifested where there's a weakened cell memory so on a path in in a past life he'd been on a slave ship rowing a slave ship and they've been whipping him repeatedly so it had gone where there was a weakened cell memory from the whipping on the slave mm. ship and then he also had an entity attached, which was a strict school teacher, and she had a ruler, and she was hitting him on his wrist with a with a ruler. So that was why the cancer had manifested there. So I did his best I could in the session, and I gave him extra time. And as as he was leaving, he turned to me through the door and he said, "You know, and this is a guy in his forties. He went, do you know my mother's not noticed how serious this is?'" And I thought, "Ooh, you know." He, he wants mummy's attention and he doesn't want to heal this till mummy pays him some attention because the wounded inner child yeah. wants mummy's attention and so when i said well you know and i've given him all this info saying when is you when are you going to see the surgeon he was like in a week's time i said we well, need to come back for another session before then and i thought we need to get to the bottom of this inner child stuff anyway he cancelled the session <laughs> Even though I printed off all this stuff from probably Vernon Coleman and what doctors don't tell you about, you know, cancer surgery. Anyway, I thought, let him go, just let it go. But I couldn't. So I sent him an email saying, you know, it's been a few weeks now. What happened? Did, did you see the surgeon? You might not have liked me, but you were really good at going inside yourself. Maybe you don't like my personality or whatever, but please go and see someone else who could help you to do this. And he said, no, no, I got what you said. I read it. I appreciate it, but I trust my surgeon. I thought, oh, this is not yeah. going to be good. <laughs> and, um, I said, oh, he said, but he couldn't operate. And I said, oh, so so if you trust your surgeon and he can't operate, then I don't understand. And he said, well, I'm going to have my arm amputated on Saturday. Oh, my God. I'm like, I was like, oh, my God. This guy, rather than face his inner child, would rather chop his up. So I thought, I'm not leaving it there. So <laughs> I, you would. I, don't care. I don't care if this guy hides hates me for the rest of his life if i trigger a healing in him and it saves his arm it doesn't matter so i email back do you think mummy will be nice to a little boy with one arm in the hope that it might trigger yeah, him yeah. <laughs> i never heard from him again and i actually was in cornwall at the time and i think i cried for three hours on the beach for him thinking oh my god he's gonna cut his arm off i can't believe it and but I had to learn the lesson, especially yeah. as healing empaths and sensitives, you know, to to detach, to to you know, it's so hard because you think, oh my god, yeah. you know, you're gonna cut your arm off. And then I, I had another lady once, she's only 23, which was really, really sad. She had leukemia, and you know, she was dying of leukemia, it was really bad. And we got to the point where we saw what had manifested in in the soul level it was this hatred of her of a man who'd incarnated as her brother in this lifetime and she really hated him and i said if you don't forgive him and forgive this past life you're gonna die of leukemia she went i know i'd rather die i'm not forgiving him you know so you can't always get people to heal but at least they will know why they're leaving on a soul yeah. level. Yeah. You, yeah. you know, and it is it, shocking. You think, well, gosh, it's so simple. Surely forgive, stay, <laughs> you know, but it's not always it, like that for everyone. No, sure. yeah, and no. and we, we see it from that perspective, but maybe from a much higher soul perspective, there's more to be learned by that experience of actually mm -hmm. leaving. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I think everybody on some level, on some way, in some sort of thing, we're all committing suicide in a way by all our choices and actions every day. Because once we start to learn that we could potentially stay in a physical body for a lot longer than we've been told, and how do we go about healing that body? And we're all, you know things we think things we eat 
how we live our lives are all contributing to our demise without us realizing that's what we're doing but mm. we're programmed in that 3d matrix to to accept death to accept aging and i always love that great book whether you believe in jesus or not it doesn't matter because this is a beautiful channel book I think she's passed over, Claire Hartsong. She wrote a beautiful book called Anagram Mother of Jesus. Have you read it? No, I haven't, but I've heard of it. Yeah, because in it, she channels this story as if she's Anna, the grandmother of Jesus. And she says she was in the same physical body for 600 years. And she averaged out looking physically about 35. And... Um, and then she got tired. She, she, I can imagine 600 years in the same body, you been getting tired. And uh, I think she'd, you know, her life had got complicated because she'd had children with so many different people and that like her grandchildren were also her children. And so it's like yeah. really weird kind of concept. Um, but she got to the point where she'd had enough and she just said, I, I'm, I don't, I don't want to, to be in this body anymore and I'm going to eat certain things and that will age my body and I will go through the natural dying process and that's what will happen mm, mm, yeah that makes sense yeah. uh, what was I, I was going to ask oh yeah so <clears throat> when people come to you for a session do they know what they're cut do like most people know what they're coming for and when they come to say oh I'm stuck I can't move on or something then do you go into the Akashic or you go into the past life, where do you go with it? Where do you well, start? <laughs> I've got two lots of clients because I work on Skype. Well, I say Skype, but I don't look at people because that, that would stop me doing what I do and it would stop them from dropping into their emotional self. So because they're, you know, a lot of them are abroad, you're using the sound frequency, but I'm not using the video so they can just drop into their emotional self. But the ones that come to see me for in person for regression, I mean, I have all kinds of people who come. Some say I just, I mean, the highest client that I love is the ones who say, I have no idea who you are. I was meditating. I got given your name in a meditation. And um, here I am. <laughs> I <know. laughs> yeah. I love I love those ones but the other people often think they're coming for one thing and that's what we do deal with the one thing they think they're coming with but then once they go inside themselves they realize that there were other things that they needed to sort out and it's a journey you know it's a, a journey mm -hmm. inside yourself so if I'm working which is the emotional Akashic records on Skype there or the phone they're, they're just telling me this is what's going on in my life now i don't know how to clear it or get to the bottom of it i don't know what's going on and then i'll see what it is it might be entities attached um it might be trauma from childhood it's not it's all interlinked so in how i work i don't believe that you can truly serve the client in the best way possible if you go well I only do inner child healing I only do past life regression I only do spirit releasement you can't you need to be able to do all those things at the same time for that person because it's all interwoven so in the past life they'll psychologically talk about what's going on in their life now and then I'll have intuitively tuned into what I think is going on as well and then we'll just weave in between to clearing everything to the zero point field um, so in regression in person you're taking them back to the origin of that and clearing it to the zero point field so that that helps them to heal as well um and we're just clearing the past life to till it till it's neutral there's there's no negative energy mm. And with the with the, the inner child or the wound trauma, um, you're just taking people to heal the trauma in the child aspect of themselves, which is predominantly outside of themselves. So that part of them has fragmented off. It's outside of themselves. It's not in them. So we heal the story because the child needs to have its story heard. And then we release it energetically out of their body with light language and then opening up and um, maybe doing some sound healing in themselves. 
and then bring the healed aspect of themselves back to the adult version of them. Mm, yeah. And, and then with the entity, you can't just get rid of entities. You, you know, a lot of people think they can. And then I've spoken to some people who say they do spirit release them. And I'm like, how do you get rid of the entity? Oh, I shout at them. I'm like, oh, that's not really helpful. You can't really do that. That's not going to help. Um, you have to take the client back to the day of the emotional cohesion of the day the entity attached to them. So that might take them back into a past life because some of these entities have been reattaching every mm. time that soul incarnates. They hang on the astral plane and then they feel the frequency of the being of that person and magnetically drawn to them again until you get to the to the soul story between that person and this person. Sometimes they don't know them and they've just attached through a resonance of their emotional state of being. Mm. And there's a hole in the client's energy field and they've been through that. And over time, they've worked, you know, sometimes I'll say, you know, sometimes they can have 90% control over a person. Yeah, yeah. When the entity goes, that client feels like they, they go through a bereavement. Oops, sorry. Um, they go through a bereavement because <laughs> they've never... Um, <laughs> they go through a bereavement because they've never had their own thoughts and consciousness before. You know, to be to be yeah. alone with your own consciousness is scary. Because they're like, it's gone. It's gone. It's like this overriding voice or energy that's trying to tell them what to do is gone. You know, some of them, some of them have even told me over the years that they've struggled to get to even come to the session. You know, they've booked a session. Yeah, yeah. And he's telling them, don't trust her. Don't go and see yeah. her. Don't go and see her. Or, and, and so they cancel the session. Or or they say, oh, my God, I've had that much trouble finding your house. Like, you know, I was getting sent round in circles. But it's the entity trying to stop them. Yeah. And then sometimes the entity comes comes you know i speak to the entity so i push the client's consciousness into the background and the entity comes through and you know can be quite rude and nasty to me and i'm like oh charming and uh, and they go i'm not speaking to you and uh, i'm like okay well i'll just carry on speaking to you and then they go oh you're clever <laughs> <laughs> but usually it's just their ego defending themselves because they're frightened and they act all rah. You know, sometimes they're really rah, you know, like rah. I've seen people literally, I, I mean, I probably shouldn't say this because it'll put people off, but I have seen people fall to the floor, foaming at the mouth, shaking, mm. you know, and you are like, oh my goodness. And, but you, you know, if you stay calm, stay in your heart, you can you can help people um so i think the thing is people dabble in this but they really don't know what they're dealing with and you know it you have to be quite grounded i think to be able to deal with what you're gonna deal with and also you know people are going back sometimes to healing very traumatic things that have happened in this lifetime that yeah. they might be in denial of or disassociated from and in no way do you want to you have to be very careful um especially around sexual trauma that you don't preempt them in any way or feed them in any way you just want to make sure that that person says i think something happened they might have a conscious memory or they yeah. might not and that kind of memory is best only ever brought up in person, in regression, where you're not feeding them in any way. And they're just naturally going back to that trauma. So you help them to heal it yeah. and heal for people. With people who have a memory of some kind of trauma and you've worked with them a lot, you know, and they're used to being on the spiritual path for many years when the healing comes out of some people it's very uh primordial it's literally like howling 
you know, and I and I've talked before that you know when people end up sectioned in in the UK, which means being put in a mental health institute, um, it's their healings that their their traumas coming to the surface to be mm. healed, but they're not being given the opportunity. And and I've heard lots of stories where when they're in these facilities, they start to howl because the healing's starting to come out, but they stop mm. them from howling and medicate them. Yeah, <laughs> and instead they need to be allowed to howl and release this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell you what, it reminds me of um, Ghost and uh, Patrick Swayze. They're saying, "I'm Henry the Eighth. I am. I am. I'm Henry the Eighth. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, we'll be going big." <laughs> yeah, mm. and, and films are great, aren't they? Because films are, in some way, telling the truth. Yeah. <laughs> They want us to believe it's fiction, but it's actually the truth. All right. Hey, really um, bad feedback, she said. Yeah, not too sure what's going on here. Hey, um, I was quite surprised to see there's some photo on your yeah. Facebook. Yeah, who's platform. that? Who's that? Yeah, does she young oh, man? <laughs> Hold on, I'm just going to move my, move my chair a little bit. Um, <laughs> oh, um, I don't know. I think it's just a past life. Um, <laughs> memory of being a look i was a lakota in quite a few lifetimes have you been native american either yeah. of you yeah I don't, I don't know what tribe he is but yeah he's lovely isn't he? <laughs> we yeah, don't we worry about what tribe he is <laughs> i remember as a child seeing a native american person for the first time and i was just like oh you know but it was it was that past life memory yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I've seen the past lives where I was male in a Lakota tribe and my tribes were annihilated and, you know, the grief that came out again was yeah. howling grief, you know, I'd been this male, you know, and in, in Native American tribes, you know, you were the elder, you're meant to be protecting these people and I couldn't protect them, they killed them, mm -hmm. you know. And, and the grief that came out was huge. And it was really funny because when I was in Sedona, I did um, did end up at a Lakota tent <laughs> and the paintings were Lakota on the tent. Amazing. Mm. Yeah. Hey, um... so I feel oh, that's that picture there. Oh, that was another story. That's in um, the Big Valley. Island. Of, Big Island away. This is the yeah. Valley of the Kings. Yeah. yeah. Adrian, Adrian and I have been there on there. an ancestry yeah, trip. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow! Did you go to the big waterfall at the back? No, uh, we were on, we went swimming on the beach because um, I had background in surf lifesaving, so I knew where to go and swim. Oh, wonderful! Well, in my mm. naivety, I went with this Swiss guy. <laughs> I thought I was going for a little walk, and it said "extreme danger, do not go in." And um, I said, "Oh, how long will we be?" And he went, "Oh, about fifteen minutes." So I was like, "Oh." Okay. <laughs> About eight hours later, I came out. Oh, my out. God. <laughs> oh, yeah. What were you doing in there? We waded through rivers. It says don't go in. So we waded into these rivers. I had my rucksack on my head, and I was up to my neck wading through water. And oh, my God. And it was quite an experience because I have no idea where I was going. I was just up for an adventure. And um, we... Then it started to rain. We'd gone so far into this forest. We must have been about two or three hours into this forest and it started raining then. And then I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fall here. And it and then I heard this voice in my head saying, and he offered his hand to help me, to drag me, you know, along. And <laughs> Um, the voice in my head said, no, Mama Chia help you, Mama Chia help you. Because I think what he realised was we'd gone too far and it was raining and he didn't know what to do. And he thought, I don't I don't think she's got the strength to make it because <laughs> it's quite dangerous now because it's like landslides. And this voice went, no, Mama Chia help you. Because I knew that if I held his hand, his fear would make yeah. me worse mm. so i need to stay in my own energy and this mamachia woman helped me and every time i pull a piece of grass which looked like a piece of grass to hold on to it turned into like a piece of rope and so i went through this forest and when you get to the very end of that forest there's a massive waterfall and when i look at the pictures back 
there's there's like this apparition of Saint Francis of Assisi in the back of the waterfall. Wow. <laughs> And then, and then when we had to hike back, it was dark when we hiked back. And by then, I'd just totally given up any hope of anything. And, and the funny thing is, he, he then went into fear. And once it went pitch black dark, he started stumbling into all kinds of sticks and getting cut on his legs and everything. And I'd just given up. And because I'd given up and totally trusting this Mama Chia voice that was talking to me now, I mean, I only had a bikini on with a throw over it. That was <laughs> <laughs> and I just walked. I, I was, it was like I was just gliding through the forest. And I came out the other side with not nothing had touched me. <laughs> wow, amazing. <laughs> Go on. But, then, but like, what I see is that we stumble into these initiations without realizing that that's what we're actually doing mm. you know it, it sometimes naivety is really good and <laughs> trust and just oh, go on, a, on an adventure and then i spoke to some kahunas and i said oh i went to that valley of the kings and they went oh where did you go and oh right to that waterfall and they went you went to the waterfall uh -huh. I said, oh, yeah. I said, it was quite dangerous. And they went, yeah, people have died in there. I said, yeah, but I heard this woman called Mama Chia. And they went, oh, she was an old kahoot who used to live in the forest. Oh, wow. Amazing, eh? Because so they knew her. And I think there's a gorgeous book. Um, again, another magical story. There's a book called The Secrets and Mysteries of um, the Big Island, written by a friend of mine, P. Lau. And I loved this book when I was in Hawaii. I eventually got this book, The Ancient Secrets and Mysteries of Hawaii. And I thought, I'd love to meet this man. He just sounds amazing. And then when I was in Sedona one time, he messaged me on Facebook and said, hi, I'm Pilau. I went, oh my God, I love your book. And he was like, would you like to meet? So I met him in, in um, Sedona. Wow. So, you know, it's how yeah the yeah oh, my favorite place is sedona my favorite place yeah hey, um, times, yeah Mine's Hawaii. oh it was lovely but sedona's got something magic about it hey um when i change the subject because you've seen us the um Cadices, but I was reading your little story behind the scenes there and you now walking into the world of michael lamb and the anarchy and Neil and um uh his brother and part of the um anarchy and the nephilim and how they went and started changing the dna that was really interesting to see this um well you can call it Cadiz, but you had another name for it didn't you i don't know what it's probably from a while ago i had a run-in with them well i've had a few <laughs> run-ins with those lot <laughs> which is enki and enil and then the That's sister it. was near her stag she was and the then, genetic scientist, wasn't she? She's the genetic scientist who played around with um, creating the four major root races, the human ape and the um, human dolphin and the human hawk and the human, um, oh, what was the other one? Dolphin, hawk, lion. Mm. We're going well, back we're going in millennium. These guys are immortals. Yeah. Well, I had a run-in with, with Marduk once before oh, I knew Marduk, oh, yeah. Yeah, Marduk, Marduk's the son of, I always confuse it whether it's Enki or Enil, because one's good, one's bad in, in the stories. So um, I was saying to a friend, actually, she used to live in Cornwall. Uh, I said, oh, I feel this energy somewhere around me. She said, oh, I think I can see it. I think I said, I said, I feel I need to get rid of it. You know, like, I don't know what it is. And, and then she was like, well, you'll have to come and stay with me. And I was like, I don't need to stay with you. I've got my own place. Well, I'm going to stay with you. And, and I thought, this is really weird, like this story. So I said, thank you. And then we ended the conversation and I lay down and I thought, I've got to get rid of this thing myself. So I just lay down and, and um, this, this energy came up and it was really angry. It was like banging, you know, as I relaxed in my body, it was banging its hand down, shouting away. And, you know, when you're in your own house, you can let that happen. <laughs> so it was shouting through me and it was really angry. And um, 
it said the children of light will not enter the portal of Marduk. This is what it said to me. And um, I just felt this serenity come over me. And I said, the, the children of light will enter the portal of Marduk. And I embody myself as a living goddess and the children of light will enter the portal of Marduk. And with that, it had one big last angry rant and pff, went. Mm. <laughs> and then, but I didn't know who Marduk was, so I had to then look up yeah, Marduk understand the whole story but this thing was ancient it was thousands and thousands of years old that was attached to me mm. you know and it just went once you know and i've seen it with clients you know i've asked them how long have you been attached to my client are you are you the one in charge or is there somebody above you and there's often like a kerfuffle in the background and then these other beings come forward going yes what do you want and um <laughs> But the bizarre thing is that, that as soon as you call them out, like I say, you know, I don't have any authority to make you go. You know, I'm very clear about that. But basically, what are you doing? My client hasn't given you permission. They go, they have, they have. And so they perceive your naivety and your ignorance as tacit consent. You know, your fair game. If you, if you don't know how the rules of this world work, then you're just fodder for their... For their agenda and so then what i do is try and explain to my client what's happening who this being is and they're oh no i don't want them attached and i go oh do you hear that they don't they don't want you attached you know because that's you asserting your power and authority and so they and often you know you'll say to some of them who haven't had a physical body they're not like people who've had a physical body they've never had a physical body and so you say to them, what have you been doing to my client? And then they tell you, and then you ask them, have you been attached to other humans? What have you been doing to these other humans? And then they'll tell you, because they're fairly honest, bizarrely. Mm. They're kind of quite happy to be honest. And then I'll say, well, are you attached to any other humans? They go oh, thousands or millions of them. I go, well, I don't think you have permission to do that anymore. Like, you know, and you need to remove your consciousness attachment and they'll happily go and do it. They'll say, okay, we're going now. Then we guess we'll tell the others. Brilliant. <laughs> they do a job lot. <laughs> Yeah, they do a job lot. And the client often says they see them spiraling out of their body, like they just spiral out. Mm, mm. And they're gone. And, and then they say, oh, my God, I feel so much lighter. Oh, I bet. <laughs> Definitely. You know? So I, I, don't, I think we don't know the absolute truth yet, do we? I, don't, no. I think nobody knows the absolute truth. We've just got from my perspective, experiences I've had with clients and my own experiences. And then I hear other people telling their story. But I have heard people saying Sitchin isn't correct. You know, that, that Sitchin wasn't absolutely correct, that he was, you know, part of the agenda as well. And that that isn't quite the truth. And so you only need to be a few degrees out with the truth yeah. to you know, so I don't know what the absolute truth is. I think the only thing we absolutely know is that we are capable of way more than we've been allowed ourselves to believe mm. that we are. Mm, and that it does seem like we're disseminating this civilization now quite rapidly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Hey, yeah. Uh, how, how good's this crown? That's a lovely crown, isn't it? Well, a crystal that's crown. <laughs> That's beautiful. I think ultimately we're going to crown ourselves because that's what it's about. You're crowning yourself as a sovereign being. Nobody can do that for you. You know, so this concept of, you know, kings and queens outside of ourselves is the byproduct of losing consciousness and misunderstanding the truth that we are a sovereign being so if you're a sovereign being and you're in the highest potential of yourself then you have the highest potential for humanity so surely in the, in in that way we should be in a consciousness where we don't need leaders but because we've fallen in consciousness we need leaders but we need leaders who care about humanity yeah definitely. not care about a corporate agenda and so, you know, at the moment, it isn't leaders who care about humanity. They're pushing a narrative for a corporate agenda, which serves only a ruling elite, which isn't fair. It isn't a just way. 
Mm, mm. I have to say, you saying about saying about the crown, I can hear my mum used to say, I'll crown you. <laughs> now I know what she meant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so right. what? <laughs> right, Carol's Gen ask, asking a question here. Um, I'd like to know, do entities attach to someone else when the host person dies? How at risk are people around a deathbed from inheriting the entity? That's a valid point. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people do hoover up entities then. You know, that's the truth. <laughs> Get the vacuum out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is, though, it's like your love. The whole thing is that we've misunderstood love as well. Like... Um, I can explain about my uncle dying. So he wasn't really my uncle. He was a family friend that I called uncle. And when he died, he left me some substantial amount of money. And I was so in gratitude. I just really didn't think that he would give me anything. And I was in so much gratitude. I'm like, oh, my God, that is so kind. You know, like, la, 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 la. You know, it's enabled me to buy this chalet. <laughs> so... I was so in, a, in in gratitude, but then I started to feel like I had symptoms of diabetes. And I thought, oh, I feel like I've got diabetes. I thought, oh, he's not... and then it just, my intuition asked, you know, have you attached to me? You know, I, I spoke to my uncle and he went, oh, hello, yes. And I said, how, why have you attached to me? He said, oh, well, what you do is so interesting. I thought I'd like to know a bit more about that, you know. And I said, well, but, but you had diabetes and now I'm manifesting symptoms of diabetes. Like, oh, I'm so sorry about that. And I said, but how did you attach to me? You know, often I ask, how did you attach? And he said, well, you were so grateful for the money. It was easy to get in. Oh. <laughs> so it, was, it was too much gratitude. Yeah. Mm. He said he'd got in through too much gratitude. Mm. Says, a lot for your do says a lot for your document, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we can be too grateful. Mm. You know, it, it's a balance. Yeah. Being grateful, but not like, oh, too grateful. <laughs> yeah. to too angry, to this, to that, to too naive, to, you know, you can have had an operation, you can have had a yeah. shock or a trauma and they get in. Mm, many ways, but, eh? But I think as long as, you, and, you know, the, de the deathbed is, again, too, too, you know, but I, I can talk, you know, I was quite emotional when my mum passed away last year through just sheer exhaustion and tiredness and, and the shock of, you know, you know, it helped so many clients and they, they said, oh, it was such a beautiful death. Thank you for the advice that you gave me. It helped me. But my mum's death was horrific. So yeah. it was it was so shocking to me, you know. And, and sleep deprivation of looking after someone that, you know, on the deathbed, you could, I mean, my mum had gone probably a week before her physical body shut yeah. down. It, it was quite traumatic. And again, that was probably because her ego didn't want to go, you know, and she had dementia shows, she was very confused and she didn't think it was her time to go, which was, difficult as a child when you're having to tell your parent that they are going to have to go but you've now become the parent and they're the child mm, yeah and i think dementia is a way of unpacking because my auntie in the care home now has dementia and she's she's 97 but she's got a light now and my mum had this light as well that she only really acquired in the last sort of eight years of her life this real radiance but she maybe had it when she was younger and then I think tra a lot of trauma had happened in her life for her and she like lost her light and then the light came back again mm. yeah. so um I know this one, this is one of my favorite places this is on the Somerset levels isn't it do you think it probably is yeah, oh, yeah. I might. Yeah, I don't think I've taken that picture. It might have done. Yeah, I can tell you, it is. 
Um, there's a little bridge you go across. It's got black um, railings and that. And um, you look up that. It's not that particular spot, but it's just a bit further. Over here is a fish ponds from memory. Over here. Oh, do you know what it is? It is. It's by my house. <laughs> I thought it might be. <laughs> have you been there, Jeff, a lot? Have you, have you been there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you live um, in, in England? Pardon me? Did you live in England? Oh, for six weeks at a time for about 12 years. Wow. I used to go every year. But were you born in Australia? No, born over in New Zealand. Oh, you're from New Zealand. Yeah, they've got some magical energies there, haven't they? Yeah, aren't they, Jess? I yeah. love New Zealand. Yeah. I have to so, say, uh, all the time we've been talking, your aura, the blue in your aura is, is really beautiful. I've been watching. Oh, I don't know. I'm, 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 because I hadn't set it up properly. I'm not where it's very light, I think. I think I'm in no, the dark. Are. No, no. It's normally really bright in here, but today it's not that bright for some reason. Oh. Anyway, uh, yeah. gone yeah. on a go on. Oh, did you want to say anything else? Um, no, no, I was just going to put this photo up. <laughs> the best thing that came out of dating a psychopathic con man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I saw that. A nice and, then, <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, we got a, we're having a a blonde moment here. <laughs> that's pathos. I think that's pathos in Cyprus. Oh, I've been there too. Yes, that was a lesson dating a psychopathic comment. <laughs> a young one as well. <laughs> and we went to pathos. Was, yeah. Um, yeah, my daughter got married there. Oh, did she? Wow. Yeah. It's lovely there because you've oh. got the Aphrodite energies, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. And then there's um, Adonis over there at the waterfall. Yeah. <laughs> so many magical places, eh? Yeah. Hey, um, anyway, so the bottom line is um, <clears throat> what question um, have we asked you that we should be asking you? I don't know. All, all <laughs> questions are relevant, I always think. <laughs> I don't know. I can't. Hey, um, let's take us back till uh, six. Okay, so it'll be 9.30 your time, yeah? Let's talk about how we hit the roadblock. Yeah, and well. Uh, I... And then um, I fired up, you retaliated, and then... <laughs> We were then thinking, how are we going to run the show? And then 22 minutes later, you came on. Oh, was it 22 minutes? How bizarre yeah. is that? And yeah. Then, um, yeah, so the thing was, you opening statement was how you sat into it and pushed yourself through it. And um, I think from my, from my perspective, I thought to myself, okay, I probably had some doubts about you. And those and doubts were... <laughs> <laughs> remove themselves by you saying this is what I've done and done and push through that in terms of relationships and I thought okay now I'm listening and so I had to go back and change all the coding and all that stuff because I removed it thinking you're not coming on um yeah so I, well I just was patiently doing all that while you and Andrina carried on I thought hmm this is going to be an interesting show so but there's a lot of things that you've gone and done the places that you've gone to that Andrina and I have actually either done it together or done separately individually then you also got one there looks like you've been in spain with the Qatars, isn't it um france oh i've been in france. spain i've been in spain and this one here mm. i've been in um round rennie le chateau rennie le ban alette le ban around there bugaresh i go there quite a lot but i've been to andalusia i me. Yeah, and I, just, I loved it there. Yeah, mm. yeah, that was magical, Andalusia. So it's and amazing how you can be. Here we are. I'm in Australia. Uh, Andrina's in the UK. You're in the UK, and yet, until today, for me personally, I've only just met you now. But it's amazing how uh, footsteps that we've actually walked, that we we've gone to and seen. It was part of our opening conversation when we were just having our little dialogue between each other you know, the dreaming the new dream and the passions and how we walk in somebody else's moccasins and we get an understanding of it um you just gave us that quality time 
before the show to actually um, fall into our own heart space to say, okay, we'll just, okay, we haven't got anything to go with, but let's go this and work intuitively, you know. And yeah, I don't think it was completely um, anything to do. It I'd been had a go at by a few people yesterday. <laughs> One of them was, I mean, this shows you how you can lose your centre quite quickly. I was in the laundrette down here and um, I put a box of washing powder in the curtains to take them to be washed in the laundrette. And I forgot that when you get there, because I because I travel so much and like I've travelled so much since last Friday, um, some of the soap powder had gone on the curtains. It just frittered a bit on the curtains. And I put it in this washing machine. Then I thought, oh, do you know what? I think I'll put it in the other one. And I took them out. But I hadn't actually put soap powder in. It's just there were some little flakes that had fallen out of the box because these come preloaded with washing powder. And I know the guy in the laundrette. And he's ex-police, so he can be quite... And uh, so he came out and he had a real go at me about these flakes that that had fallen on the floor but there was no brush I couldn't get them off because they were tiny and um he had a real go at me and I said oh I didn't put washing powder in your washing machine I said I know not to do it you've told me that lots of times over the past I said there were just flakes left on the curtain that was in a box that tipped over so you've got to over communicate your truth because he's just carrying on going on and on about how I'm going to ruin the washing machine. I said, I know that. I said, I didn't put them in there. He said, yeah, but then you tipped it that. I said, no, it fell out of the bag and there was no brush to brush it up. But you just have to remain calm. And then so he had this whole thing. And because he's an ex-policeman and I could see in his face, I thought, oh, he looks like he's got liver damage because he had all this liver damage energy. And, uh, you know, he, he's obviously taken the last two years quite hard, I thought. And uh, so I thought, wash that energy off. And then I go outside and normally he gets upset. He'll let you park there, but he will be aggressive about how you can park. Then my auntie rings me going on about my auntie in the care home that... I'd tried to, because I was worried about her well-being and whether she was being treated properly. And this seemed to upset other people, um, my caring. And they got quite defensive and angry with me about it. And then it was weird while I was listening to my auntie go, wah, 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 to me, you know, trying to almost gaslight me. Um, it was a weird experience because as I was sat in my car, you know how you've got the wing mirror in your car? Some random pretty girl walked by and she tapped on the window and she said, can I look in your mirror? I said, oh yeah, yeah, you can look in the mirror, whatever. <laughs> and, and she's looking in the mirror and I'm talking to my auntie. And then she says to me, does my face look orange? I said, no, it doesn't look orange. Just your makeup looks pretty. You've got lovely eyeshadow. <laughs> And I'm thinking, you know, how random is this girl's looking in the mirror of the car while I'm talking to my auntie, he's going a million miles an hour at me. He's just had to go in the laundry. <laughs> oh my god. And then and then I did realise that when I came home, and I think this is for all of us. I, I was triggered by my auntie, you know, I was pushed out of my centre and I knew this morning I'd woken up not back in my centre, hmm. you know, it triggered like a form of post-traumatic stress in me, you know, from, from, you know, and you're oh, it's like, oh no, I've fallen for being gaslighted, Ooh, <laughs> you know, oh, I've done it again, you know, kind of, and just to come back to your centre again. So then because I'm not familiar with Steam Yard and I couldn't find the charger for my computer, yet I thought I came here with one and I had a painter decorator yesterday here, so everything's upside down. And then I found the charger and then I still couldn't get in. Then I thought I'll do it on my new phone and I still couldn't get in. And, and it was like blocking me. And then I had to put all the passwords back in again and reload Google Chrome before it would let me, I had to change, I had to actually change the passwords. So, so from my perspective, if I had to change the passwords, I had to move on to another frequency. Okay. You think that's what it was? 
Well, <laughs> who knows? Because <laughs> I was thinking, it just uh, this is not making sense. It's there. Why is she not going in on it? Why is it? <laughs> Anyway, it's yeah, all and, then, and then Jess said to me, 150 people have done this before yeah. you. I was like, no, I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it. I can't. There's no way. So sometimes you have to then break that energy and then you can either regroup really quickly and <clears throat> clear everything. Because then, then what I was thinking in my mind, which is useful for people to realise this, I reflected on the guy shouting at me in the laundrette my auntie shouting at me and I was like I'm not letting these people who've knocked me off my center you know stop me from what I'm going to be doing because otherwise they've won and that means the darkness and the lower vibration has won and it's not going to win because that's not where we're going <laughs> hey um I have to say, I spent most of the afternoon going through all your bloody website and Facebook, finding all these photos in there. I really loved this. I think it's just fantastic. Yeah, I like and it as well. I stopped waiting for the light at the end of the tunnel and lit that bitch up myself. <laughs> I, thought that was, <laughs> well, I thought that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think in my own personal <laughs> I think that in general, and I, and I say this in a positive way, in general, nobody has shown up for me. So I have had to show up for myself. And, and I think what had triggered me yesterday was my auntie, without going into the minutiae detail of what she was saying, she was saying to me, well, you're a strong person. And I said, yeah, but I've had to be because nobody showed up for me. So I've had to become a strong person. And I realized that, you know, having watched people commit suicide in this last two years that I knew and it having shocked me and even before that, a friend's daughter did as well. It's you either get to that point where you either sink or you swim. And if you can swim, it's in those lifetimes or those points in your life where nobody does show up for you that you have to show up for yourself mm -hmm. and if you don't find that strength you probably will leave you know yeah. so it's it's that do or die kind of energy but from my perspective I see them all as wonderful teachers even if they're being horrible to you because in that moment you get to choose that you can either be a victim and you can stay in that lower frequency or you can go, you know what, I am a strong person, but not not in the way you're saying it to me. You know, like, it's all right for you. You're a strong person. It's like, yeah, but strong people don't just arrive at being a strong person. Yeah. There's a lot of lifetimes and a lot of people throwing rocks at you for you to become that strong person because sometimes you listen to people's stories and it's one tiny little thing and they're crucified they don't rise up again they're like that's it it's over they can't rise up again and and it's like when you do rise up you become a stronger person from and then you become a force to be reckoned with because people don't in general with where the consciousness is at right now on the planet people don't because you'll tr you'll start triggering people and and they won't like that because they will project all their shadow at you mm. um but it's not you they won't even see who you've become if they're not in that frequency no. they only see their own shadow so you show their own shadow back to them and they don't like it because it's really painful and uncomfortable. And you're only trying to ask, what would you do if you lived in love and cared about humanity? What would you do? You wouldn't tolerate some of these things you're tolerating. You wouldn't, right. you would, your truth, you would call out these injustices. 
So when you come along going, actually, I don't think that's okay. I think that's not appropriate. I think we need to ask questions. We need to, they don't like it. No, no, of course not. Of course not. Yeah. There's no anyway. calm and no drama. That's why they say no calm and no drama. Because right, you, otherwise you're that you're that oh you're that pinball in a pinball machine and um the pinball is just bouncing around and and you're just going from one drama to another drama instead of rising beyond it and being self-navigating instead of being pushed by other people. Brilliant. Right. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> We've gone way over time, but it's been... <laughs> it's I been want to say more about Jeff and <laughs> Andrina, although I know quite a bit about Andrina, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that has to be another day. About does Jeff, do you talk about yourself and what you do sometimes? Do you, do you have you interviewed Jeff? No. No. <laughs> he, he never stopped talking. Come on, get off. <laughs> <laughs> He's been quietish for two hours. <laughs> I know, that makes a change. No. He's been very quiet. I'm very no. patient. But then if we had your no. sister on here, she talks for England and by the United Nations. Well, so you've Carol. got a lot in common, you two. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty to well, share. I had, I had a um, look at, Andrina was telling me you're in pool right now. So I was looking at the energies of pool and it felt really nice energies in pool when I looked it up the other day. Yeah. Oh, I love it down there. Yeah. And I, and I buy the, now. well, I'm, I'm about four miles out. I'm in Corf Mullen. So I, I'm currently on a farm, so it's, it's lovely because I got horses and goats and chickens and a um, couple of dogs and sheep, and they're all they're all old. There's I think she's got thirteen of them, and that, you know she she just loves them. And I watch them, and they're all they're all they all come lim limping back. <laughs> it's lovely to watch, and I think oh, sending them lots of healing, like they're you know because they're just old, but they still can eat and walk and and be happy like you know but just watching them all limping in and out oh. yeah well there we go anyway right. I'd, oh, I'd like to say thank you so much for making it eventually <laughs> pushing and, through I like that Jeff said it was 22 minutes because that is I love 22 and it's a master number and yeah definitely yeah. definitely so anyway it's been a pleasure <laughs> So thank you, Jeff and Andrina. That was lovely. Yeah, yeah no, that's thank what the you. show's all about, isn't it? Sharing mm. your passion, yeah. Yeah. Dream the new dream. From Cornwall. Yeah, and the Cities of Light in Cornwall here, which is Hale Beach here, which is where I think the Cities of, of Light are. And when there was a Venus-Jupiter alignment once, um, that picture might be somewhere, but I quickly took a picture of myself, but it didn't just take one, it took a few. And when I saw one of the images within those few seconds, I wasn't human. Really? I looked like a bog-eyed creature, but I'm sure they're quite nice beings, but it was, it was not human. And so that's mm. here, the cities of light here. I, I, I haven't been in Cornwall in years, but... Um... Well, you go down to St. Nicholas Glen, don't you? Yes. Yeah. St. Yeah, Nicholas Glen, Madron. We're near Madron. Yeah. But apparently St. Nicholas Glen has become quite commercialised now, someone said. Uh, not surprised. Oh, yeah. You won't know until you get there. I like the Mintak Theatre. And um, I like the story of um, the Pisces, or the Pisces, and um, how at harvest time they used to turn up at different farms and get onto their... Um, scrumpy and um at one stage there there was this guy in the cellar there and he's drinking with them and they taught them how to sing a song and then they would teleport to the next cellar and get on the drink so they spent the whole night doing this and anyway this human um forgot the song and he fell asleep in the cellar anyway <clears throat> he gets arrested and he goes to the court and he's prisoner so and so and he's there and um he's talking about this people he's having a drink with and the guy who owns the, the farm says no there's only you mate you know you just 
<laughs> away with the fairies, you know. Anyway, this old lady turns up in the court and goes, pushes her way up. And she said, hey, you remember that song we were singing last night? And so she starts a song and he starts remembering. So he starts singing the song and next second the two of them disappear. So apparently it's in your local court records there. Really? Yeah, really interesting like story. Another, yeah. yeah, another dimension. Yeah. It's on that um, road runs along the Atlantic coast. There's a pub there all by itself um, before you get up to St. Ives. Yeah. Oh, because there's, there's a really famous one, but that's further down, and I forget what that's called because I don't go to them. But... Yeah. And it's then close to where... Um, Stan and Elaine got married, love, Andrea. Mm. Yeah, in that area. Mm. Mm. Anyway, there's um, a little side story. Uh, <clears throat> all right, well, um, we'll chuff off and um, stay on. We'll just um, finish the broadcast and you can stay in the green room. Okay. okay. All right, folks, um, you're listening to Radio FM 88 Australia. It's um, coming up for um, 5 to 9, which will be 5 to 12 for our friends in the UK who are on the show. Thank you for coming through. Thank you for listening, and we'll um, see your comments. And you can catch up on the Radio FM eighty eight Australia site. You can catch up on Andrina Forest. You can go onto the YouTube channels of Andrina Forest or Radio FM eighty eight Australia. It's been our pleasure to have Andrina and Andrea on the show tonight. Next Thursday is um, we're having an RDO known as a roster day off because it's going to be Thursday night, and next day is by Easter. Easter Friday, so we're having the Thursday night off. It'll be coming back the next week, and um, it's Mr. Michael Lamb himself, our esoterical <laughs> wizard that every female on this planet wants to watch and take home. To and home. take him to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, we got a comment there. Who's, who's saying that? All right, Jennifer, here we go. Just saying thank you very much. She must be a mate of yours. All right, well, thank you, and... Um, Good evening, good night, good morning. Okay.